Today we're going to be building a summing or mixing cable. Uh, these combine two or more audio channels into a single audio channel using a resistor network, so they're essentially just a passive mixer. A lot of people try to use Y-shaped splitter cables for this purpose, but these are not suitable for combining two signals, and it can actually be dangerous to do so since the outputs will be low impedance and will attempt to drive each other at high currents, potentially damaging the output amplifiers in the process. Rain published a great article in 1991 explaining this problem, and it's now on their website, so I'll give you a link to that. Splitter cables should only be used for splitting one output into two inputs, and even then it's not a great idea as it can easily lead to things like impedance mismatches and ground loops. This particular mixing cable is going to be used to combine the left and right channels of a 3.5mm jack or TRS or phone connector, call it what you will, into a single mono XLR connector. These types of cables are typically used to connect a phone or laptop or MP3 player into an active monitor speaker, since a lot of speakers on the market only have XLR inputs. This kind of setup is popular with fitness and dance instructors and people like that, and it's a much better solution than bespoke fitness sound systems which are typically underpowered, overpriced, and very fragile. I've never found anyone selling these particular cables off the shelf. Um, you can find passive summing boxes, but that's a rather inelegant solution, requiring you to use two cables and a box. You can also get straight through TRS to XLR cables, but they're intended to carry a single balanced audio channel. The two signals are opposite polarity copies of the same mono signal, rather than being left and right. Using these cables would send a stereo audio signal down the hot and cold conductors of a balanced audio cable, so the two signals would cancel each other out, leaving you with a horrible distorted mess. Anyway, we'll start with the XLR end, since that's where we're going to be putting all the circuitry. The connector I'm using is a Neutrik NC3MXX, the newer version of the NC3MX. Uh, which has been the industry standard XLR connector for at least two decades. These connectors are great. I mean, I've never seen one break. They're really easy to assemble. They can be recycled and reused in new cables probably hundreds of times. I mean, they're the industry standard for a very good reason. These newer XX variants are ideal for our purposes as they have quite a lot more space inside to fit the components we're going to be installing, but you can, if you're careful, install them in the original NC3MX. Now, when you're building cables, always start by threading the cable through the connector's boot. If you don't do it now, you'll forget to do it later, and nothing feels worse than spending ages assembling an intricate cable only to have to immediately dismantle it again to attach the boot. I'm also going to put a piece of heat shrink tubing over the cable. This is to act as an insulator and strain relief for the cable once we've assembled it. Next we have to strip the cable and tidy up the ends. You probably want to strip about an inch and a half of cable. Um, we'll cut this down later but it's good to have lots to work with. The cable I'm using is Van Dam Tour Grade Classic XKE microphone cable, which is again deservedly pretty much the industry standard. It has two conductors. We could get away with using cheaper one conductor instrument cable, but that would mean we'd have to put the circuitry inside the TRS connector, and I really wouldn't want to try squeezing all the components in there. Also, doing the summing nearer to the input will reduce noise, but as the cable's only 1.5 meters long anyway, that isn't really going to make any difference. Now, you want to cut the two red and blue wires very short, maybe a centimetre max, then strip the insulation off them and tin the ends with solder. Leave the shield or ground wires long for now. Next, we'll need to solder a quarter watt 470 ohm resistor onto each of the red and blue wires. These are actually half watt resistors, which are all I had to hand, but they'll do just fine. Trim one leg of each resistor down to a couple of millimetres and tin it with solder. Leave the other legs long for the moment. After applying flux to make sure we get a nice clean joint with no pointy bits, we solder the short leg of the resistors to each of the red and blue wires. Next, we cut two pieces of heat shrink tubing to appropriate lengths, slide them to cover the resistors and solder joints, and then twist together the long resistor legs. It's important to make sure there are no sharp pointy bits in the solder joints, as that could puncture the heat shrink. We shrink the heat shrink with a hot air tool. You could just use a lighter or even a soldering iron, but be careful. Now we have to tin the twisted resistor wires with solder and then trim most of the excess wire off. Make sure to leave enough to solder into the connector. The shield wires then have to be trimmed to the same length as the resistor assembly, covered in heat shrink and tinned with solder. The three pins of the XLR connector also need to be tinned with solder. Now we can finally attach the cable to the connector by melting the solder on the pins and pushing the resistors and shields into them. The resistors should be connected to pin 2 and the shield goes to pin 1. The XLR connectors should have the pin numbers printed onto the plastic beside each pin. Finally, we need a third resistor to act as the input ground impedance. This resistor goes between pins 1 and 2 and should be a quarter watt 20 kilo ohm resistor. Pins 1 and 3 should also be connected together since we're connecting an unbalanced signal into a balanced input and the cold signal should be tied to ground in that case. We'll just use the extra length of wire on one of the legs of the resistor to achieve this. Place the resistor below pins 1 and 2, wrap one leg around pin 2, and wrap the other leg around pin 3, making sure it comes into contact with pin 1. This might be difficult to understand, but I've drawn a diagram that will hopefully explain it. 
Anyway, once the resistor is in place, it's just a case of soldering the legs onto the three pins that they touch. And that's basically one end of the cable done. Uh, we just have to shrink the insulating heat shrink around the entire assembly, install the connector chuck, pull the boot up onto it, and screw the shell into the boot. Now it's time to move on to the other end of the cable. The TRS connector is much simpler to assemble, but a little bit more fiddly. Um, the connector itself is made by Rian, which is a subsidiary of Neutrik that deals with consumer level connectors such as RCA and quarter inch TRS. This connector is the NYS231LL, which is the large cable variant of the standard NYS231, allowing us to use this relatively thick cable. Again, we want to start by threading the cable through the connector boot, and also there's a little plastic insulator that comes with the connector. We just need to strip a very small amount of cable this time, perhaps around 10 millimeters. You want to make sure that the connector strain relief clamp will be able to grab securely onto the cable sheath and not onto the wires or screen. After stripping and tinning the three conductors and also tinning the connector itself, we just solder them together like with the previous connector. After that, we clamp the strain relief around the sheath with a pair of pliers. Now these jack connectors aren't quite as robust as the XLR connector, but there's some things we can do to beef it up a bit. To start with, we'll use some super glue in the screw threads so the connector boot is locked in place. Next, we'll glue some heat shrink tubing between the boot and the cable to add to the mechanical support the strain relief clamp gives us. Simply add some super glue to the connector boot and the top of the exposed cable, and then slide some heat shrink tubing over the entire assembly and heat it to seal everything together. This has to be done in one swift movement, otherwise you might get the heat shrink stuck halfway and it's a pain to remove. Now that we've assembled cable, it's time to test it. The way I normally do this is to plug it into a laptop and amplifier, start some music playing, go to the sound card balance properties and check the left channel and right channel individually to make sure they're both working. And yeah, if that's all fine, it's time to wrap it up and uh, send it off to the customer. Here's another one I made earlier. 